Welcome to Formula Bones 2022 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix Recap. I'm Jared Borislow, but you can call me J-Bone. Let's get into it, folks. J-Bone! First up, let's talk about the biggest storylines from the 2022 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix Race Weekend. First and foremost, the main storyline from this past weekend was Sebastian Vettel's retirement. Seb is an all-time legend of motorsport because he is one of the most successful drivers in Formula One history, and while it's sad to see him go, I'm not totally convinced that we will not see him back on the grid again later this decade. More on that later. Though the race itself was a little bit, let's say, less eventful than last season's Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, it actually featured more overtakes than the last two Abu Dhabi Grand Prix combined with multiple drivers engaged in overtake, re-overtake battles and charging through the field because of superior tire strategies. We even saw a double overtake from Fernando Alonso as he passed both Botas and Sonoda in one corner. Speaking of last season's race in Abu Dhabi, there were a couple things we saw that mirrored it and made me feel like I went back in time, which coincidentally Mercedes, which they could do, so they could stop themselves from ever designing the W13. First, there was Lewis Hamilton once again redrawing the Yas Marina circuit map and cutting turn seven completely out of it. Last season, Lewis controversially straight-lined the runoff area on the first lap there after claiming that Max pushed him wide, and then he never gave that place back to Max, which was the most controversial thing to happen in that Abu Dhabi Grand Prix until... Well, you know, and this season, Lewis did that all over again, but this time it was signs instead of Max, and he actually did end up giving the place back. The other deja vu moment was a Nicholas Latifi Mick Schumacher battle that caused Latifi to crash. Last season, Mick pressured Latifi into making a mistake and crashing, which brought out that fateful late race safety car that, you know the rest. This season, Mick and Latifi actually both crashed during their battle and did the most beautiful synchronized car pirouette that there has literally ever been. Uh, Mick was actually given a penalty for it, though both cars were able to continue on, so no safety car was called out. We actually got no safety car all race, which is good because I think a lot of people would have had some pretty upsetting flashbacks if we had gotten one. Now those were the two deja vu moments relating to last year's race, but there was also an opposite day moment. I'm of course referring to how last season, Checo defended valiantly against Lewis to help his teammate Max, and this season, Hamilton defended valiantly against Checo to help, well, himself, but it was still a great little battle and is part of the reason why Checo did not end up passing Leclerc by the end of the race to get P2 in the World Drivers' Championship. Now, I think this was kind of a little bit of payback for Lewis for Checo's defenses against him last season in Abu Dhabi as well as in Turkey. If you can think of any more deja vu or opposite day moments from this race, let me see them in the YouTube comments. Some additional 2022 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix notes. Ironically, Mercedes somehow made it all the way to the final laps of the final race of the season with neither of their cars suffering a mechanical DNF until Lewis retired with a hydraulic issue right there at the end. Now say what you will about the W13, but it was reliable, reliably mediocre, but with flashes of brilliance kind of sounds like a few drivers on the grid, if you ask me. Speaking of DNFs, Alonso finished the season the only way he was ever going to finish it, by not finishing the race because of another mechanical DNF. Nobody is happier to leave their team and teammate right now than Fernando Alonso. Additionally, Crofty said the thing. I was the human embodiment of the Leonardo DiCaprio pointing meme when Crofty said, here comes Sebastian Vettel, during Seb's final race in Abu Dhabi. A great tribute from a great commentator about a great driver. At the end of the race, 
Max got his record 15th victory of the season, and Checo lost P2 in the World Drivers' Championship to Leclerc by three points, so those shenanigans by Max in Brazil did not end up mattering. Now, someone should tell that to Jensen Button, who said in his post-race interview with Checo that Checo lost by just one point, causing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people to think that Max solely prevented Checo from finishing P2, which is just not the case. It's now time to check in with you all regarding how my three bona fide race predictions fared at the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. And guess what, folks? Your boy J-Bone went three for three. J-Bone, J-Bone, J-Bone. My first race prediction was that Sebastian Vettel would finish in the points in his final Formula One race. And ding, ding, J-Bone got that one right. J-Bone. Like I said, it was just inevitable, folks. I was never in doubt on this one, not even when he was clearly going to finish P11 until Lewis's mechanical DNF. Never in doubt. My second race prediction was that Charles Leclerc would finish ahead of Checo Perez to finish P2 in the World Drivers Championship. And ding ding, J-Bone also got that one right. J-Bone! Both drivers were on different tire strategies, which made this one come down to the wire In the end, Leclerc's one-stopper was the move and not Checo's two-stopper, though Checo certainly didn't get help from the lapped cars, nor help himself by getting stuck behind Lewis for a little bit due to overtaking Lewis on the first DRS straight and then immediately getting re-overtaken by Lewis on the second DRS straight. My third and final race prediction was that the Ferraris would finish well enough to not lose their P2 in the World Constructors Championship to Mercedes, and ding ding, J-Bone also got that one right to go 3-4-3, three, three, baby, J-Bone! After a shaky start, the Ferraris looked better than the Mercedes for most of the race, then George's penalty and Lewis's mechanical DNF sealed this one up. My take is that the Mercs realized near the end of the race that their only hope was praying to the F1 gods that the Ferraris would DNF, but that the team radio to the F1 gods came through a little bit scratchy, so the F1 gods ended up DNFing Lewis instead. Now, I told you all that I was going to go three for three this week, and I came through for you, okay? Pretty big of me. A lot of people are saying it's one of the greatest achievements all F1 season long. Now, I kind of want to give myself an additional half point for going three for three, but three and a half for three doesn't even make sense because three for three is perfect, so I'm not going to. J-Bone! This episode is sponsored by Bird Dogs, and for being a member of the Bone Brigade, you will get a free, incredible gift with your order of the best shorts, pants, and joggers on planet Earth with my code FBONE, that's F-B-O-N-E, on birddogs.com. Colder weather is here for many of us, And Bird Dogs makes the best pants and joggers you will ever wear, I promise you. I've worn Bird Dogs pants or joggers for almost every single Formula Bone recording, including right now, because they are like existing inside of a cloud. Bird Dogs are the best because you can do anything in them, because they are so insanely comfortable, and because you can get them with built-in underwear that feels better on your skin than the finest silk sheets and is also super breathable, does not bunch up like traditional underwear does, and the best part, it cuts down on laundry in a big way. As far as that free gift goes, it could be any number of crazy gizmos and gadgets such as a rope hat, a dad hat, a tumbler, a pair of nunchucks, a whistling football, and much, much more. So go to birddogs.com right now, enter promo code FBONE, that's F-B-O-N-E, and they'll throw in that free gift with your order. You will not want to ever take your bird dogs off, I promise you. There's a link for that deal in the description of this episode. Next up, it's time to respond to some Abu Dhabi Grand Prix themed voicemails left by members of the Bone Brigade, just like you on the Bone Phone. The phone number for the Bone Phone is one 833 966 And if you live somewhere where it is difficult to make phone calls, I've also created a channel in the Formula Bone Discord server where you can submit voice memos directly from your phone rather than calling the hotline number. Check that channel out via the Discord invite link in the description of this episode. Also, even if you don't want to send in any Bone Phone submissions, Come join the Formula Bone Discord anyways because it's very fun and we have a great F1 community growing there that just broke 1,000 members. So come hang out. Now without further ado, here's the first call. 
Hey, J-Bone, what do you think would have happened with Paris and Leclerc if lap traffic hadn't gotten in the way of them with a few laps to go? Do you think Paris would have passed Leclerc or the order would have stayed the same? After the race, Checo came out and said that he was not happy that he got held up by the lapped Pierre Gasly, who was battling with fellow backmarkers Albon and Joe at the time. Checo believes that he lost a second or more to Gasly ignoring blue flags on his way to eventually finishing 1.3 seconds behind Leclerc to miss out on P2 in the World Drivers' Championship. We'll obviously never know whether or not Checo would have gotten the job done had he been let through sooner, but after watching the onboard footage, I, one, am not convinced Checo lost more than 1.3 seconds to Gasly, and two, I think it was more a case of bad timing than Pierre being totally at fault. Where Checo was trying to pass Pierre was up the inside at an apex where Pierre was closely following Albon. And given the circumstances, I think it's reasonable that Pierre didn't let Checo through here because Checo showed up late enough to where Pierre would have had to sacrifice a decent amount of his own track position to let Checo through, which I think is not fair because the lapped cars, while being lapped, are still racing. I think it's a lot easier to point to Checo getting stuck behind Lewis for a lap due to bad DRS strategy paired with a lockup as a bigger reason he didn't catch Leclerc, along with solid tire management from Leclerc. Next call. Hey, Jay Bone. It's Daniel from Salina, Texas, calling you bright and early here before the uh, Grand Prix starts. Uh, Martin Brundle's grid walk, he interviewed Seb's dad. And he made it seem like Seb might make a comeback or might not be done. Uh, could we see Seb pull an Alonzo and come back in a couple of years with Audi um, to be the experienced driver on their team? Um, I know not only me, but probably the entire Formula One world would want to see that. What are your thoughts? Thanks. Bye. My personal take is that there's definitely a chance that Vettel, who is German, will return to F1 to drive for German manufacturer Audi when they join the grid in 2026. Vettel will have three full seasons between now and then to decide if he wants to rejoin the grid at 38 years old. And I fully believe that if he wanted to rejoin the grid, that Audi would sign him in a heartbeat because who wouldn't want Seb on their team? My guess is that right now, not even Seb knows if he's going to, in fact, do that and that it will depend on how these first three years of retirement go for Seb and how much he misses racing and using it as a platform for good, which is what Seb is all about. Next call. Hey, J-Bone. Sergio from Monterey, Mexico speaking. Now that the 2022 season's over and with Max still getting booed after what happened in Brazil, I just wanted to know what you think the driver dynamic between Max and Checo could look like next season. Could we maybe be looking at a Checo with a much different mentality and driving style next year? Or will Red Bull find a way to bring things back to normal during the holidays? So, yeah, thank you. J-Bone. To be fair to Max, he was getting booed long, long before Brazil. As far as what I think Max and Checo's relationship will look like going forward, I think this weekend answered a lot of the questions I had. Max and Checo seem to, at least publicly, have squashed their beef, and it looked like the same old Max and Checo as they interacted with each other and the team and press all race weekend long. I think the fact that Checo ended up losing P2 to Leclerc by three points is extremely good for their relationship going forward, as if it had been one point, like Jensen Button accidentally said, that would have meant that Max actually did screw Checo out of P2. For the record, Leclerc held the more wins tiebreaker over Checo, so even if the margin had been two points instead of three, Leclerc still would have won via tiebreaker, even if Max had let Checo through. Do I think Checo will still hold a bit of a grudge because he feels underappreciated by Max and Red Bull? Yes, I would too. I think any normal person would. But do I think he will go rogue and start not being a team player because of Brazil 2022? No because I think Checo is too nice and also too smart for that. However, I do think Checo probably would have gone rogue had those two points in Brazil ended up mattering. Next call. 
Hey, Jared, it's Matthew from the south of France. I uh, hope you're doing well. J-Bone, uh, yeah, just wanted to call in and ask what your thoughts on Logan Sarge, actually, given that uh, the Abu Dhabi race not only marked the end of the season for Formula 1, but it also meant the re- end of the F2 season, and in which Logan Sargent managed to secure P5 in the race and therefore P4 in the Drivers' Championship and get the super licence points needed for his F1 graduation. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. And uh, as always, love the show. J-Bone! Folks, we officially have an American driver back on the Formula One grid. Logan Sargent came through clutch, a.k.a. didn't choke, and finished the F2 season with enough points to earn his FIA super license, meaning he will be the driver filling Williams' second 2023 seat, which was the final open seat on the grid after Haas sadly announced Mick Schumacher's departure and Nico Hulkenberg's arrival. Hashtag Hulkenback. I am super, super excited to have a fellow countryman and a fellow native Floridian competing in my favorite sport for the first time since I, along with many, many other Americans, became Formula One fans. And I am officially declaring all us new Logan Sargent fans to be members of Sargent's Army as I salute our new American hero. However, I think it's very important for all of us members of the newly formed Sargent's Army to temper our expectations as he's both a Formula One rookie and in the worst car on the grid. It definitely will not be all smooth sailing for Logan in 2023, which is why he will need us there cheering him on every single step of the way as he starts this new chapter. Let's go, Logan. Next call. Hey, Javon. It's Connor from Australia. I was wondering what your thoughts on Daniel Ricciardo's position going to Red Bull is for next year and if he'll get a seat for 2024. Javon! It definitely does make me sad to think about how Danny left Red Bull not too long ago because he wanted to be a number one driver and now he's back at Red Bull as their number three driver. But I truly think being back at the team where he had all of his greatest successes will be massive for Ricardo's confidence and could get him out of the funk he's been in. And in saying that, I mean both the performance funk and the funk that is the reportedly weird-to-drive McLaren F1 car. That being said, I have no clue if Daniel is going to be back on the grid in 2024. Realistically, I don't see any way he ends up in 2024 in any seat that's not either Checo's if that driver-team relationship deteriorates, Alonso's if he retires because he can't stand Lawrence Stroll, an Alfa Romeo driver's if something weird happens there, or an Alpine driver's if Ocon and Gasly can't stop fighting with each other. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see, folks. All right, listen up. The 2022 Formula One season is now over and Formula One is officially in its off season, but Formula Bone has no off season. I'll still be constantly uploading new Formula One content here on social media and more every single week of the Formula One off season with my first piece of off season content being my ranking of the top 10 moments of the 2022 F1 season that's dropping next week I also have some super exciting new content series planned for the F1 offseason that a ton of you have been asking me for for months, so stay tuned to Formula Bone now more than ever. Additionally, if you want to support Formula Bone financially and are able to, I'd really appreciate it if you bought a piece of Formula Bone merch available now at the link in the description. And if you're looking for a free way you can support Formula Bone, Just toss the YouTube video of this episode a like and my YouTube channel a subscription so that the YouTube algorithm likes me more. To stay fully up to date with Formula Bone, you can join over 1,000 members of the Bone Brigade in the Formula Bone Discord server via the invite link in the description of this episode. And you can also follow me on all social media at Formula Bone and at my real name, Jared Borislow. That's at J-A-R-E-D-B-O-R-I-S-L-O-W. Until next time, folks. J-Bone!